Metal zzz. <laughs> metal zzz. Lots of metal zzz in plural. <laughs> Multiple Olympic gold medals was the reward, but the journey, that wasn't always gold. And I took off taking my victory lap, and the um, cameraman had the big camera, and he was following me. He's like, slow down, you're supposed to savor the moment. I was like, you better come on, because you don't know what I've gone through. While running and winning for years on the track, at home, she was in an ongoing health battle. I don't care if I have to knock on every doctor's door. I'm not going to stop until I get an answer. I was built for something more than this. Multiple time Olympic gold medalist and world champion Gail Deaver shares her journey now on The Pulse. Guys, welcome to another episode of The Pulse. I wish you could see what was going on behind the scenes, because I was about to come on camera all decked out in gold medals and whatnot and tell you about stuff that I won <laughs> casually since the last time I spoke to you. Gail Devers, you actually won them. I did. Would you, would you have dimed me out if I came no. back talking about hey, Because you are a gold medalist in what you do. No, nah, I'm really not. I mean, I'll take it. <laughs> yes, That's yes, cool. yes, you are. I and mean, there's like a handful of people in the world who understand what it feels like to be the best in the world at anything. <laughs> like at, at any career. Right. And you got, look, she got medals. <laughs> medals. <-zzz. laughs> Lots of medals -zzz in plural. <laughs> What is that? And you were so humble about it. What does that even feel like? I'm you know, it's a blessing. Medals. No, you can. I don't I'll wear work. them. Okay, I, I will. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a blessing. I mean, it really is. I, I think about all that I've come through it. And, and for me, I always set goals for myself of what I want to achieve, and I write it down. And then I sign it like a contract to say that I'm committed to doing everything in my power to see that this goal is accomplished. And that's what I had started off doing back in 1988. And... It just didn't work out. I started having other problems. I started off as an American record holder, so I was on top of the world. Mm -hmm. Then I felt like somebody took that world away. By the time I got to Seoul, Korea, I ran slower than I'd ever run in my life, and I didn't make the finals. Okay. Now, there There's were a problem. other things going on. Yeah, but I didn't know that. I'm like, right. you know, you go from the best to the worst, and it's like, what in the world? You know, and I, I then my weight started to drop. I went from 120 to 80 pounds. There's a problem. Yeah. There truly is a problem. I was tired all the time, and yet I couldn't sleep. My, um, my hair was falling out. Now, this I cut, but my hair was falling out at that time, mm -hmm. and nobody could tell me what was wrong. When I did sleep, my eyes didn't close all the time. I had problems with my eyes. They were bulging. They were red. They were irritated. They were dry. They were painful. I want to paint the picture. So you're one of the best in the world at this I was this an American point. record holder, you're yes. You're in peak physical yes, condition. absolutely. On Olympic team. I'm going to take this off because I feel silly. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you know why I don't wear them. <laughs> yeah, but, but I didn't even hurt it. <laughs> peak physical condition. Yes. So you had every reason to believe everything was okay. Yes. And then all of a sudden this starts happening. That's what happened. I mean, okay. what I ran to, to break my American record, if I had done that at the trial, I mean, at the Olympic Games, it would have been a silver medal. So there's a problem. Yeah. And no, I did not peak too many times like the doctors were telling me. I w wrote realistic goals. My coach was Bob Kersey, so we were on point. Yeah. Something's wrong. The countless doctors that I saw saw, oh, maybe you peaked too many times. I'm sorry, we can't find anything wrong with you. Or maybe, maybe you're stressed out. Or the worst one was that I was imagining things. I'm not imagining things. I'm an athlete. I know my body, it's and I know something's wrong. Clock. I'm not yeah. imagining I ran slower. No, than exactly. <laughs> right. and, and so, and this went on for two and a half years. Wow. So as you were, and I, so it was Graves' disease. Yes. Lost 40 pounds, yeah. and you're a little person yeah. anyway. I went from 120 pounds down to 80 pounds. I couldn't train anymore. I mean, my body was atrophy. I mean, I, I w there was a, a skeletal of me. I stopped going out of my house because if somebody tell, keeps telling you negative things that there's nothing wrong, you start yourself to try to figure out what's, what's happening. I covered up all my mirrors in my house because the reflection looking back at me was not me. And you're telling me that this is my new norm. How do you keep going through that? Because, <laughs> like, you're, they're telling you nothing's wrong. Like, you just, right. you just, you got slow. <laughs> Yeah. How do you stay, and that's part of the message you continue to share with people. Right. How do you stay on point through that? It's not what other people believe about you, it's what you believe about yourself and how much you're willing to work 
when I write my goals down, I write them on sticky notes and I write them for a reason. There's something that it's a realistic goal. It's not something that says, hey, I want to run two seconds in the 100 meters. That's not realistic. Okay. It's a realistic goal that I've set down and I sign it. It's a contract that I made with myself to say I'm willing to do whatever I have to to see that this is accomplished. So no matter how long it takes, I put them in several places in my house as a constant reminder to me of what it is I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. And so throughout that two and a half years, when it almost took them three years to figure out, once I was diagnosed with Graves' disease, I, they were dusty, but I had to brush them off. And I had to get back to work. So just for context, five-time Olympian. You competed at the highest level in the world right. for 20 years. Yes. Nine-time, what, world champion. Okay, so doing that for nine years. Three Goldses, <laughs> no, right here, and and some of that, most of that, honestly, came after all of this. It did. It all came after, and I was still, even after they diagnosed me and my Graves' disease was under control, I was still having problems with my eyes. Like I was telling people, it was always hard for me to look. the The, the hurdles were blurry, and people were like, "Well, how are you running?" And the hurdles are blurry. I'm like, "Cause I'm not running in rhythm. I don't want to run in rhythm." I want to run as a sprinter, and I want to just get there. So I figured out, hey, there's eight steps from the blocks to the first hurdle, three steps in between, five steps off the last hurdle to the finish line. When I get one, two, three, five, six, eight, eight take it. Just, just take just it. Jump. Take it. Take it. Just go. Get over the hurdle and not look at the hurdle that I'm going over since I can't see it anyway. I'm looking past that. You couldn't see the hurdle. They're blurry. It's like looking through flat fascia. It's blurry. And I, I in, eventually had problems driving at night because the lights were blinding to me. And I thought all of this was, had something to do with my Graves' disease because it took me 30 years to find out that I was also suffering from not only just Graves' disease, but thyroid eye disease, which is a related but separate condition. And it has to have separate treatment. And still got goals. It <laughs> still got goals. But that's goalses. like, you know, think about it. For 30 years, there's issues and you don't know. I always tell people that's like having an unwanted guest and you didn't know they were coming. When did you, and I don't even know if you're going to answer this, when did you know you were special? A special <laughs> competitor, a special athlete? Because this level of commitment, even without everything you were going through, I feel like people who can do that, you just have to be built there. <laughs> you know what? My, my mother tells the story that I was born breech. I came out feet first. Okay, running. And I didn't come out when they told me I was going to come out. I came out when I wanted to come out, I guess, which was before they said it. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I've been running ever since, the one goal that I had was I thought I was going to be a teacher in a classroom with 25, 30 kids. But doing it God's way, I am a teacher. Yeah. And I have the world as my classroom. What am I going to do? So right now I'm recruiting. I'm recruiting relay runners to help me pass on the message so that people will become advocates for their own health and they don't have to go through what I went through. Um, did it ever just become too much? I stopped going out of my house. Yeah. Um, because I'm like, this is not me. And every time I go out of my house, people are asking me, what's wrong? Why do you look like that? Did, you know, did you lose? Well, why did you lose weight? Are you, on, are you anorexic? Are you on drugs? You know, and I'm like, the answer is no. Did you go to the doctor? Yes. Well, what the doctor said, they said there's nothing wrong. Oh, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. And you get tired of having to answer those questions. And, I'm, you know, it, it makes you start to believe, okay, well, is there nothing wrong? And am I making this up? I remember taking down a portion of the mirror that I had covered. I'm like, mm -hmm. nope. I didn't look like this a very short time ago. There's something wrong. And then you pick yourself up and you say, you know what? I don't care. I don't care if I have to knock on every doctor's door. I'm not going to stop until I get an answer. Built I was built for something more than this. It's still obviously hard yeah. for you to talk about, but look at where you are. You know, after <laughs> dealing with all that, and people didn't know it. No. So now... You're sharing that story. You yeah. just came down here from a women's empowerment yes. conference. <laughs> now, is that why? Like, you're continuing to share that story? I don't want people to feel like they're on an island by themselves. I want you to embrace a community where people understand. First of all, we have to advocate for ourselves. We take care of everybody else's women, and we put ourselves last. And that could cost us. You know your body better than anybody else. And if something feels off, monitor any changes, big or small, write them down and report them to a doctor. You know, be proactive. Stay on top of your routine doctor's appointments. Understand that you aren't any good to anyone else if you're not good to yourself. 
And then I don't care if you have to seek a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth opinion. Keep searching until you get the answers that you need and deserve. We have one life to live and we deserve that quality of life. Coming up next, why even with her many challenges, Gail Devers, she wouldn't change a thing. If I had my whole life to live over again, I would ask for everything that I've gone through. And people are like, oh my goodness, you have lost. Now set, go, let's go, come on. 1425, good, right in the middle. Now make a move in here. Aggressive with those arms, step up, push down. Come on, move. I feel like, and you do this, I, I feel like you could be a motivational speaker <laughs> on so many different topics. What's it like when you go out there and share these stories now? It's therapy for me. It still is therapy. I, I talk about certain things. I remember even when I'm talking about it and remembering crawling on the ground because I couldn't walk. You know, but then I remember in 1992 after coming back and not making the final in 88, I can still hear the gentlemen and they usually call out from the last place to the first place and you just sit there and listen to your name, especially when you're in a different country and you don't know. I remember being there, and I can hear him to this day saying, and champion de mundo from USA, Gail Divers. And I was like, ah! you know, <laughs> that's me. Exactly. Give me my you know, and I took off running. I, I celebrated with my coach, and then I took off taking my victory lap. And the um, cameraman had the big camera, and he was following me. He's like, slow down. You're supposed to savor the moment. I was like, you better come on, because you don't know what I've gone through. If I had my whole life to live over again, I would ask for everything that I've gone through. Okay. And people are like, oh my goodness, you have lost your mind. But it's made me me. It's made me tough. When I didn't think that I could make it through, I made it through. When I set a goal for myself and I write it down, I'm committed to seeing that goal. Success doesn't mean you have to be number one. It means you have to do the best that you can do. You know, we all are on our journeys and we all have times where we feel like walls are closing in on us and there's no way out. Mm -hmm. We all have that championship spirit. Sometimes you just got to reach further down to pull it up. Champions are champions in all walks of life. We got champions on the basketball court, on the football field, in the hospital, in the classrooms, you know, and so everybody has a gold medal. So after every task that I do, I look myself in the mirror and I ask myself, did you do everything that you could do? And my example is 1992, after I won the gold medal and I was running the hurdles, that 10th hurdle jumped up and got me. Mm -hmm. And I failed <laughs> and ended up coming across the finish line in fourth or fifth or whatever. I went back to my hotel and I looked in the mirror and I said, did you do everything you could do? And the answer is yes. I will take it to my grave. I'm successful. Lolo Jones. Mm -hmm. This is somebody who was one of the four best in the world. One world championships, but then got to the Olympics and right. like, fell or something and finished in fourth. Right. And since then, she's been dealing with society telling you were not good enough because so, so, you were the fourth best uh, uh, in the world. Let me talk about that real fast. I, I, and I hear people say that because people are like, oh, did you win a medal? And then somebody say, oh, yeah, I won gold. That's great. And then somebody else says, I won silver. Oh, that's... A no! Right. This is the Olympic Games. Hello? Second this is everybody in the in world. The world. Yeah. I don't care if you don't even get to a final. You made it to the Olympics. And you are always and forever will be an Olympian. Success means that you're the best you that you can be. Whatever that is. We tell kids in school, and then you get kids who didn't get an A, and they're losing their minds. Did you do your best? Did you study? Did you, get a, did you ask for help? And you did? That's the best? Then you are successful. And tell everybody else to kick rocks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious that's, about that. That's real. Because then, if we don't teach our kids that, then that's why they get into depression and other things happen. And then they're listening to what other people say because words are powerful, and I won't allow that. I will not allow it. If I hear it, I'm going to stop you. It's, it's hard because in a world of social media, somebody faceless sitting at home on their couch can tell you right. you're nothing for being the fourth best person yeah. in the world. That's why I say teammates. I, I, I'm recruiting relay runners, and what my relay runners are doing is passing on knowledge, whatever it may be in whatever field, if you're talking about health, if you're talking about... And just empowering people and being that shoulder to lean on. When somebody attacks somebody, call them. Let them know. Those are words. Those are words. And yeah, they might be hurtful, but those are words. Coming up, I seriously thought about leaving with her medals, but let's be real, I got no chance getting away. 
I'm gonna give you your medals back. Okay, I feel thank bad. You. Take thank them. you, because I, I would hate to have to. We end every episode of The Pulse with pretty much what your theme is in general, and that's the concept of use your voice for good. Mm. When somebody says to you, use your voice for good, what does that mean to you? Using my voice for good means that my life is about service, and I'm gonna help. When I know something, I say something. When I see something, I speak up. And that's gonna help that next person. Like I said, we all have one life to live and we deserve the best quality of care. And if I can reach out something that's happened in my life, I can turn around and give you that experience to help you not have to go through it. That's what I'm supposed to do. World champion, Olympian, gold medalist, this, 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 <laughs> motivational speaker, but just, you know, sharing positive messages with people. I appreciate you taking some time. I appreciate you, and I want to tell people that if you have grave disease like me, <laughs> you got to listen to your eyes. Okay. Listen to your eyes. There is a website, because you have to have a TED eye specialist. You can't just assume that anybody's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And that eye specialist is an oculoplastic surgeon or a neuro-ophthalmologist. So because it's Ted, T-E-D, that came to your town, you want to know that Ted's coming to visit you so you can be prepared for him. So go to www.focusonted.com. I appreciate you spending some time here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to give you your medals back. Okay, I feel thank bad you. taking Thank them. you, because I, I would hate to have to run you down. <laughs> no, I'm just like... <laughs> that wouldn't be a long run. <laughs> you in shape for that. I'd be like right there outside oh, the God. studio. <laughs> Guys, stay with us. After the break, you know we love to focus on people who are making a difference. We've got Kira Strong, who's from an organization called Rebuild Philadelphia, and they're doing just that to so stay with. It's a dream. It's a vision. It's hope being fulfilled. As you know, we sit back and talk about people who are doing things to change communities, change the world, and sometimes we just want to focus on the things that are changing our surrounding area. And that's what Kira Strong and Rebuild Philadelphia are doing. So thank you for coming in. Tell us, tell us about Rebuild Philadelphia. So uh, Rebuild Philadelphia uh, is the city's um, historic investment in parks, rec centers, and libraries. Uh, we're about a $500 million program um, using the sweet and beverage tax, um, looking to renovate and transform these public facilities across the city of Philadelphia. We focus on 72 different sites across the city of Philadelphia. So we touch a wide diversity of neighborhoods. We um, touch a wide diversity of sites. So whether it's a park, a rec center, a playground, a library, um, all the sites we look at are really high need. Um, they, many of them haven't seen investment in their capital infrastructure in decades. It was a commitment to providing really beautiful and high quality space that we feel like the kids and the youth and the families of the city deserve. Is that the way the community has responded? Because I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, you talk to your neighbors, you meet people, you interact with folks in your neighborhood. Um, I think building that kind of space where we can have that kind of neighborly interaction where your children are safe, or maybe it's not just children. We are working on a site in North Philly that has an older adult center, so seniors can come together. Well, and you've helped change the perception of some neighborhoods. There's certainly fears around, well, if you make this investment, who else might come to the neighborhood? Mm -hmm. We're building these investments for Philadelphians who live in these neighborhoods. Before you do anything, you're working with the community. Yes, we, I mean, that is a, was a tenant from uh, the very beginning of Rebuild, that there were a couple things. It was kind of like the three pillars of Rebuild. So the first one was we're going to invest in these public spaces. We're going to make them into 21st century spaces, right? Yes. The second was we are going to make sure that we really talk to neighbors and residents and the folks that use these, these facilities, buildings, playgrounds, et cetera, libraries, and make sure that whatever we're designing is reflective of the need of that neighborhood. And then the third piece um, was that we're going to make sure we hire Philadelphians yes. and diverse Philadelphians in the work that Rebuild creates. That was a vision from the get-go um, for the mayor, and we've really been able to, I think, successfully carry that out. And it shows in how unique our sites are across the city. You can't build anything in Philly without opposition and mm. all kinds of challenges. 100%. You guys haven't had that. I think there was a lot of groundwork done at the very beginning to make sure that we had real support um, across the board. Philadelphians tell you what they want and what they think. And if you don't get it right, they will say, we said this, but we see this on your plan or your drawing. That, that needs to change. 
We listen, we heard you, and now you see it when it actually gets built. What's next? What do we have coming yeah. up as we're heading into 2024? We have over, it's about $150 million in, in construction going on right now. Um, and in 24, we look forward to continuing that. Um, and we'll have, I, I think it's about 20 to 25 projects either breaking ground or um, cutting the ribbon and being complete. So we're super excited. People who are watching who want to get involved or maybe yeah. want something there or want their voice to be heard, what, what should they do? I'd encourage anybody who's on Instagram to please follow us there. We're at rebuild.phl. Then, of course, our website has uh, contact information. Reach out to us. We uh, check our, you know, even our general e email daily. Mm -hmm. So we respond. We're real people. Um, and we would love to hear from folks. People are not shy, as we said. So they do reach out. They say, hey, what about my site? Um, you know, what about this input? So we, we welcome, we welcome input and please reach out. Guys, thank you so much for spending some time with us today on The Pulse. Powerful stories, first from gold medalist Gail Devers, and then Rebuild Philadelphia, truly making a difference. And that's what the show is about. So I hope you enjoyed it. You know that I did. And I leave you today, as I always do, reminding you that whenever you can, use your voice for good and have a good one.